Um, for those that don't know me, haven't met me before, my name is Mel. Um, I work for Big Society Capital and um, I'm responsible for the Good Finance team. And uh, we work together in partnership with a range of um, organisations um, to host these Let's Talk Good Finance events um, for really informal ways to get a chance to um, hear peer stories. That's something we've learned that works the best, um, sharing stories from other organisations. And we're really pleased this afternoon to be partnering with the New Anglia Social Investment Partnership. And um, Laura's going to say a little bit more about that. Hi, Matt. Nice to see um, sunny northeast. I want to know why have you pinched all the sun? Because it's absolutely chucking it down with rain here, I have to say. So uh, I think it must have known put my washing out. So that's bound to make it rain, isn't it? So yeah, good. Well, I'm glad it's sunny where, where you are. As I say, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We leave it one more minute, Annie, um, and then we, we will get going. I can see you're still admitting people um, as we go. So if anybody else would like to introduce themselves in the chat, that would be great. So where have all our 51 signups gone then? <laughs> it's unusual. Quite a to low number to start in, but that just means you get more time. So we've got uh, Oona from Oh Knowledge Transfer. Okay, great. Oh, and she's given us contact details. I'm giving us contact details as well, which is really good. Great. Right. So we can use the time as uh, productively as possible. Um, if you didn't catch before, my name is Mel. I work for Big Society Capital and I'm going to host um, this session on social investment and governance this afternoon. Going to um, try and keep my bit to um, uh, a shorter period as possible um, and try and get on to um, the main part of the event. Uh, which will be to allow you to listen to our two panel speakers um, this afternoon. Um, before I do that, I'm going to um, ask uh, Laura, who's the head of VCSE Organisation Development at Community Action Suffolk, just to do some introductions and say why we're working together to run this event today. Hi, thank you. Um, so um, I work for Community Action Suffolk, which is an infrastructure organisation. So um, a go-to organisation for VCSE organisations specifically in Suffolk. Um, really our role is to ensure that the sector and its volunteers are supported, safe and sustainable. Um, so we've been, um, we've had a project running here at CAS for some time around social investment. So we had a successful funding application to the Connect Fund back in 2018, um, where we secured funding for a two year project, which was um, supporting social investment in Suffolk which looked at highlighting and developing social investment market here in the county. And it's really from this project that our current project, the New Anglia Social Investment Partnership, otherwise known as NASIP, evolved. So um, NASIP is, is hosted by us here at Norfolk, um, and we work with Voluntary Norfolk in partnership along with um, Orbit Housing, Suffolk County Council and Norfolk County Council. Um, and we have a common goal of supporting social enterprises to grow and thrive by accessing appropriate business support and finance to increase their impact in the communities across Suffolk and Norfolk. And working together um, over the two counties has maximised the partner's expertise, capacity and knowledge. So we um, launched our partnership um, in, 20, in February 2021. And, um, and through that partnership, we deliver direct support to social enterprises across both counties, including workshops, mentoring and upskilling resources, um, using the collective assets and skills um, across all of the organisations that form that partnership. Um, at, you know, as we know, social enterprises are an increasingly vital piece um, in the jigsaw of the local economy now more than ever. And they offer an approach to business, which obviously looks at their own sustainability, but also at another bottom line, that of bringing social benefits to the entrepreneurial activity and um, through income generation. So through this um, partnership, two weeks ago, we embarked on our first eight week long learning program, which has been really exciting. We have a cohort of 10 organizations that's been supported through um, a program that has um, workshops, peer-to-peer -peer support, mentoring opportunities, um, which has been really great for those organisations. 
interestingly, we had a lot more apply to be part of that um, support package, but we were only able to fund the 10 initially, but we hope um, to be able to support them through and by the end of that program, look at social investment as, as an option. So since um, NASIP has begun, um, we've grown to have 140 organisations. Um, on the network, which has been really good. So we often have requests for information on social investment and governance and, and which is how we came through to today. And we're really excited to being able to work with Big Society Capital and Good Finance to deliver this event on Trustees Week. So I think that's probably it from me, Melanie. Thank you. Okay, great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, that's great, Laura. Thank you. Um, right, let's uh, move on. I said I'll try and keep my um, my um, slides as brief as possible. But I want to talk to you a little bit about um, social investment in governments. And I thought we would do um, these three things. Risk, reasoning, and is it worth it? Because I think those are probably um, the three questions that I get asked um, most often. Okay. So um, we are going to do that session now. Um, I'm also going to give you some advance notice that we're going to be using a little tool called um, Menti or Mentimeter. Um, so if you have got your phone to hand or um, uh, another device, we'll give you several ways that you can access that platform. But um, it's just a, a quick little interactive piece we're going to do. Um, but we're going to try and move on as quickly as possible to the hear from a peer panel um, and the importance of talking to your board about social investment. We're also going to have plenty of time for questions and answers. So um, as we go through, um, if you want to jot your questions into the chat and then we can come back to those so that it's just as soon as you think of them, please jot them in. Um, and if we're a fairly small um, bunch, which it looks like we're going to be, then I may well come to you directly to answer your question. Not forgetting that there are no stupid questions. This is all about peer learning and support. And I usually find that um, if there's a question you're thinking of and you want to ask, it's probably somebody else sitting out there wanting to know the same thing. So um, this is all about having um, a safe space. OK, we're going to finish up afterwards um, with around some uh, resources and next steps, um, and then we'll tell you what's going to happen after that. Thanks, Annie. OK, so um, this is um, your um, Mentimeter. Um, you can go to this in, in a several different ways. You can either um, scan this QR code that's in front of you. Um, do you just want to leave that on big screen for a moment, Annie, if you can, just in terms of sharing. You can either um, share from the, uh, the QR code. You can use the direct link that Annie has just posted in the um, chat, um, or you can just go to menti.com and type in the code um, 318522. I can't see the other bit, sorry. Uh, that's it, okay. Uh, uh, this has got a different code, Annie, on top of this one. Sorry, if you just follow the link in the chat, that should do. Just follow the link in the chat. OK, fine. OK, that's a bit confusing. Um, if you follow the link in the chat, you should be able to get to menti.com. And it will tell me in the little right hand side. So you either can go to menti.com and you can use the code if you're doing it this way. 7016. Whoops, I can't type. 7016 uh, 7545. Um, and as soon as you're logged in, it'll this little um, uh, signal at the bottom will tell me that some people. What we really want to do is find out why you've attended this session today and are there any specific questions you'd like us to cover? So if you can get into Menti and type in, we'll all be able to see what um, everybody in the session is looking to um, achieve. If anybody's struggling with accessing Menti, if you just want to let us know in the chat and we'll hang on. OK, great. Thank you very much. So we've got um, interest to look at good governance structures for social investment. OK, that's a really interesting one to support me in conversations and work with community groups and charities keen to understand more about how CIOs can access. So that's um, um, charitable um, uh, organisations access to social investment and how attractive a CIO would be to a social investor. Well, that's really interesting. Different reasons that um, investors make investments as well. So that's, there's definitely not a one size fits all there. Um, and these are obviously core topics for us today. So anybody else want to anything particular that they'd like to cover or any other reasons that come along today? Might just be for general information, which is also fine. Uh, might just be to um, 
uh, hear the stories um, from uh, Louise and Edward, which is again equally fine. Um, help devise and refine social investment policy tips on overcoming objections from the board. OK, definitely in scope for today. Uh, understand how to set up legal structure in a charity or starting a social enterprise. OK, again, often get lots of questions about um, how you ring fence risk and how different legal structures can try and do that. I am going to caveat all of this with saying I'm not a lawyer um, and I'm not allowed to give you um, legal advice. So you would definitely need to seek that for yourselves. But um, we are used to getting these questions on a regular basis and we'll definitely share some of the tips that have been shared with us. OK, great. Annie, let's carry on then. Um, it's really good to have those in front of us, knowing that we've got to cover them. OK. Right. So let's talk about legal structures. OK, the two most frequent questions that I get asked are, how do you choose the right governance structure if you're getting started? So there was one of those in the last slide, um, as in if you're a charity and you're thinking about starting a social enterprise or if you actually haven't started yet um, and you need to think about what type of governance structure. It's definitely worth thinking right at the very beginning. Do you anticipate that you might need to raise investment? In which case, what type of investment do you think that you would need to raise? Because there, is, um, there are some restrictions that come depending on what type of governance structure you choose. And so that leads me to the second part of our conversation, which is what's possible now? So if you are an existing organization and you are constituted, depends on your legal structure as to which types of social investment you might be able to raise. Um, probably the simplest definition of those two things are, that there are essentially two buckets of social investment. There is debt or borrowing, which is a loan, eventually, essentially, or there is equity in shares, okay? Um, and only some um, legal structures that sit within um, uh, social purpose organizations would enable you to be able to raise um, equity type investment mainly because many social enterprises and charities don't have legal structures that have shares that they can raise investment against. So um, this question, um, I do remember um, around about 10 years ago, being completely baffled by the uh, nine or 10 different legal structures that sit under the social enterprise and charity um, banner. I was very fortunate at that stage um, to come across a really friendly um, uh, down to earth lawyer from an organization called Anthony Collins, um, who helped me understand the different legal structures um, using minstrels. I, I'm, I'm sure that's right. I'm sure there are other chocolate brands available, but I think it was the chocolate that helped it all go in because I, I certainly didn't understand that social enterprise was this catch all term and there was a range of different legal structures that sat underneath that. Now, um, as a um, a result of that conversation, we went on to produce in partnership with Anthony Collins, a really succinct, I'd like to tell you it's a one page guide, I think it actually spills over three pages, but it, what it does is it covers all of the different um, uh, social enterprise legal structures. And one of the things that we've done more recently is to add how that works with social investment. So I think Annie's going to share the link um, to that document um, in the chat, but also you're going to see it on your screen now. This is probably one of the most um, uh, downloaded documents that we have on Good Finance. So you'll see that it covers what type of legal structure, um, the most typical features, um, ownership, governance and constitution. Um, if there is a difference between uh, a legal person distinct from those who own and run it, um, uh, can its activities benefit those who own and run it? Uh, what asset locked means? Um, can it be a charity and how the charitable um, status and tax benefits? Um, if there's any difference um, in the law, particularly around um, the nations. And then lastly, social investment, structural applications and general guidance. So I'm just going to take the very first one. And thank you, Susan. You've used it a lot. Yeah, I still use this um, uh, You know, many occasions. I, I just find it a really easy way to just get to the nub of the matter. So um, let's go with the unincorporated organisation. And if you put this all the way across to the bottom, it's very unlikely to be able to attract social investment due to the lack of corporate structure, essentially because um, it's very informal. 
Um, there isn't any one person that you would um, hold to account, or if there were um, people you would hold to account, they would be individually personally liable. And that's not something that social investors would want to do because um, it would bear a lot of responsibility for the individuals. But if we skip down just a little bit, and just give me so I can give another example. Uh, to, yeah, if you just hang there. So um, a limited company, um, this is one um, uh, most um, charities and social enterprises, most social enterprises are companies limited by guarantee, in which case, and um, you'll see right at the end, the structure is not eligible for any kind of um, shares kind of investment. And yes, the slides will be um, uh, available. And this document is also um, always available to download from Good Finance. So you'll see here each of the different structures is outlined. Um, and uh, I think it covers most of the, the sort of um, top line bits of information that you would need. We'll just go back to the slides, Annie, for me. So the question that I often get is, so is there a right, um, you know, like, is there a best governance structure? And the answer is there isn't a best, it's what is the most fit for purpose? I have a bit of a problem with the presenting, there we go. Yeah, smashing. So um, it isn't whether there is a correct um, type, it's whatever is the most suitable organization, uh, suitable governance structure. So it's probably worth thinking right at the beginning, if you think you're going to have to raise investment, if you think that your organisation is one that is firmly rooted in the community, uh, let's say it's a, a pub or a community hub, and you might want to raise investment from a range of different local investors, there may be something like a community benefit society would work for you. If you're an organisation that thinks that you're going to need to uh, raise investment, but you think you're probably going to need a loan, for instance, for working capital. So maybe you've um, had a building or an asset that's been transferred or you already own it, but you need some money to do the development work. Then taking on a loan is essential, um, is potentially um, available to you throughout most of the different structures that have been outlined. So there isn't a best, there isn't a one site fit all, fits all, but there is an opportunity to look at all the different governance structures and see what would be best and work for you. It's also that you can use a range of different social investment structures. So for instance, with a community benefit society, which is owned using shares by the community, I have known them to take on equity, which is like shares investment, but I've also known them to take on a loan. So there isn't a simple, but I do hope that that one guide will really help you to understand more about what types of investment are available to you. So let's move on to the next slide and let's talk about risk. OK, so the biggest challenge that you often get from a board, bearing in mind that trustees are the individuals who are essentially individually responsible, should you take on any kind of investment, is, is it too risky? And I love this quote. This is from Lisa Hilda, um, who is trustee at Preston Row Women's Centre. And this is her definition of how uh, her and her board saw risk. So a lot of charitable organisations operate within one, two or three year grants and take considerable risk that these funds will be renewed or replaced. Loan investment, which helps generate an income into the organisation, brings a different type of risk, but one which is more self-determining for the organisation. If things start to go off track, you can make management interventions to bring it back on track. Ultimately, we felt the risk of continuing to rely entirely on revenue and grants funding was far greater than shaping our own destiny with loan investment. The key word here is balance. There is always risk involved in any venture. Which are the risks that are most acceptable and manageable for you and your organisation? So um, one of the things that you said in the um, why you've come along today is how to help your boards get comfortable with this. And we actually have a whole host of resources as part of our Get Informed Social Investment for Boards, um, which tell more of these um, peer stories. The biggest tips that I've picked up along the way is make sure that you bring your board into these discussions early. Don't do all the work and then bring them in at the end. And also try to make sure that you recruit some skills and that, that have the ability or the, the opportunity to think really hard about whether social investment is that level of balanced risk. And there's a little bit more behind Lisa's story. If you go back more than 10 years, I think the first time that she tried to do this, they did lose about half of their board. There were some people just thought that it was a wrong thing to do to take on debt. I think they're now on their 11th iteration of taking on investment. They have grown 
um, each time they've done so. And so that will bring me neatly onto my next slide. Is it worth it? OK, so this is, I think, the actual question I get asked the most time. You know, Mel, is it worth it? All of that due diligence, you know, the, the additional risk, um, taking on debt. Is it morally right? Well, the only people that can actually answer that question are you and your board of trustees. Um, and this is a lovely quote from Maslina, who is chair of the works, an organisation um, up in Yorkshire. So social investment has provided us with the working capital we needed to grow and to meet the needs of the charity. Boards need to better understand the various options available and how social investment can support their charitable mission. So I often say to people that social investment is not a thing in its own right. It is essentially another tool to create impact. So if after you've considered, what will you use the money for? Can you afford to repay it? Is it a balance of risk that you feel is worthwhile doing? Do you have your board on board? And will it help you to create more impact? Those will be the things that will help you decide, is it worth it? Okay. Lovely. That's a really quick um, whistle stop tour. Handing over to our two peer speakers, and I'm really pleased to be able to welcome um, Edward Hickman, um, and he's going to talk to you um, a little bit about um, his experience um, with um, his chair of SEA Traf Trafalgar and also Merton Music um, Foundation. So, Edward, I'm going to hand it straight over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, very kind introduction. Uh, so today, I, as mentioned, I'm involved with two different organizations which I would describe as charitable enterprises and the one I'm going to talk about is SCIA um, which is a holding well it's a, it's more than a holding but it, it's a charitable enterprise based in Southampton so a different geography from Suffolk um, it works and operates around Southampton Hampshire Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight predominantly and its name um, suggests what it does it, it's predominantly involved in social care which in this context is actually domiciliary care uh, it was founded 30 years ago um, i got involved in 2014 as a trustee uh, when one of the lenders to scia was big issue invest and they had a seat on the board which came with their loan and they asked me to take that seat for them and i'll i'll fill you in on more of that later so the, the organization, as I say, is 30 years old. It predominantly delivers services to contract with the local authority, with, with local government. And so it's very much a contracting uh, revenue business, which has all the risks of, of winning the next round of contracts and getting renewals and so on. So one of the decisions that the predecessors of my time took was to try and diversify revenues. And in 2005, they had an opportunity to get into NHS dentistry, um, providing dental services uh, in parts of uh, Southampton, Portsmouth and areas where NHS dentists were not necessarily providing services. So it was effectively providing dentistry where it wasn't there before. Um, and at the very outset, they took on various loans actually from Big Issue Invest at that time, which were spent uh, either mortgaged against the properties that they were investing in to deliver the service. And I've got a history here of some of the loans. So the first loan was taken out in 2006, and it was a 20-year loan of £200,000. Um, they were variously refinanced, these loans, and, and over the years, but they've borrowed over the years uh, around that sort of order of magnitude in different formats. Um, anyway, the, 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 the organisation, as I say, it started in 2006, five and interestingly going back to mel's point about what's the structure um there was a legal reason why it had to be a separate organization because if you're going to do dentistry you have to have a majority of dentists on the board and so they actually had to set up a separate mutual it was actually a registered society um regulated by the fca um funnily enough and that became a separate operating subsidiary and so one of the governance questions we've had all along is, is the uh, number of SEIA actually had, has about four different boards within it, just because it's built different organizations up over the turn, over the year. Um, so there's a kind of complexity that potentially builds up with that, which I, I'll come back to if anybody wants to get more detail on that. 
Um, just to give you a bit more of the history, so it ran very successfully for quite a long time, but um, we actually sold the dental business last year in 2020. And the reason for that is I joined in 2014, as I said, and became chair in something like 2016 or 2017. Um, and what we found in the run up to Brexit uh, was that we were having struggles to deliver our contracts. Um, and the struggle was recruiting enough dentists to fill the chairs. We had something like 26 dental seats uh, across six practices. And the interesting thing about this is that it became more of a struggle. And we, so it became less and less profitable. In fact, we started losing money, um, particularly after Brexit, when a lot of our recruits who used to come from Eastern Europe no longer wanted to come. So effectively, we started losing quite a lot of money. And as a board and as a group board, we had to decide what to do. And we ended up with a, with a decision whether to either go back to our lenders, and borrow some more money and basically get the organization up to a different scale. What we worked out is we were slightly subscale. So we were sort of halfway between being a one person dental operation and a, a bigger sort of 20 plus practice operation. The interesting thing about this is it, you, we, we had those decisions to take because we were faced with some operational issues and we basically made it, came to a conclusion at the board of SCA Trafalgar and at the group board level that we didn't have the resources or the capacity to really take this and grow it. And that gave us a decision to effectively put it up for disposal. So uh, interestingly, structurally, we had to actually create an operating subsidiary that could be sold uh, to do that. So there was some work to be done around that. But that was that's pretty much the story of, of that. So picking up on the governance idea, how did we manage all of that process? So one of the key, key issues always was to have a series of scenarios that we could look at. So we always had, in effect, this happens with um, social investors. They generally want you to put to them a business plan that has a sort of banking case, as they would call it, uh, what you might call a management case, e.g. what you really think you're going to achieve. And then you have an upside case, which is if everything went really swimmingly, you, you do even better. And you do all your sort of financial risk and resilience tests against the, the worst case, the banking case, which is when performance isn't potentially as good as it could be. You have other costs that turn up and so on and so forth. And it's that um, level of analysis that actually helps the trustees on the board get comfortable with the idea of borrowing money um, in order to grow and develop and expand the business. And as I think Mel's slide put it, there's always risk, whichever way you go, even if you go down the grant route, in terms of the way the grants flow and so on. Um, but it is about having some confidence in, in the business model that's been, or the business plan that's been put to the board. Um, and a lot of that is built around the confidence you have in your CEO and your and their team to put that together. And it, 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 that's really how the role of the trustee, I think, is all around taking an overview of all the risks and seeing whether they are manageable in effect and what mitigations there are and so on and so forth. So I think that's um, a quick summary of, of the SCA Trafalgar um, story. Uh, I can give lots more chapter and verse about, about what happened if, if we get into a Q&A on that. Um, in terms of the other organization, Merton Music Foundation, we interestingly have quite a lot of grant income, uh, about a quarter of income is grant, but the rest is actually generated through lessons uh, and music services. And the, the reason I was talking, raising this just now is that we had to take a view as a group of trustees there about what uh, particularly when COVID and the lockdown restrictions uh, came last year, about how we were going to manage through the potential loss of income uh, from lessons. And I think in that context, what we took the view that if reserves are for anything, they're for seeing you through a kind of one-off, or hopefully a one-off event like that. And, and we, again, we did a business plan that allowed us to lose some money um, over two years. Uh, we thought we could break even, but we would lose money in the middle. And it has turned out to be that case in the end. But again, we the sort of risk management was all about looking at the downside and seeing where 
those sort of low points might be and what that meant in terms of cash left in the bank and the reserves position and so on. Um, and similar story to this here, it's all about trusting your management team uh, and the particular the finance team within, the, within that to really give you enough of a flavor of all the, the upsides and downsides. And then you start as a trustee to take an overall view. Um, and it's very important to have that conversation ongoing uh, between board meetings as needed. Because um, it is crisis management sometimes. So you find yourself putting out fires, as I would phrase it. But that's my sort of very brief um, run through of, of my experience as operating a trustee across two different organizations in recent times. Fantastic. Thank you, Edward. There's lots of things that you brought up in there that I'm sure we're, we're going to come. Hello all again. Um, my name is Louise Hale. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of a relatively small charity up in um, West Yorkshire. We're at Ilkley Community Enterprise. We're based in Ilkley. Um, I was, I've been the CEO um, kind of part-time for now for about two and a half, three years. Prior to that, I was one of the founding trustees of the charity. Um, the, the board, um, about three years ago, asked whether I would, um, on a very, very temporary basis, they told me, um, uh, act as the chief exec, just because we had quite a lot of development um, on the cards, to which I said, yes, and I've yet to escape the role. <laughs> So um, I thought it would be useful just to give a little bit of um, background on us as an organisation before I talk about our um, experience of, of social investment. So um, Ilka Community Enterprise, we're a registered charity. Um, we started formally in April 2013. Um, we're a social enterprise limited company. Our purpose is all around social inclusion with a particular focus um, on that agenda for people with learning disabilities. We, we spent a long time, um, we spent about two years um, actually planning outside the box before we incorporated as an organisation um, and as part of that quite lengthy kind of planning and preparation process, we distilled our kind of core uh, differences, our distinct um, aspects of us as an organisation. And, and they are that we're very, very community focused. Uh, we've only been able to get established and to survive with the support of our community. Um, as our name outside the box suggests, we wanted to bring a fresh approach, a bit of a 21st century approach to the way that our client community, so people with learning disabilities, are actually supported and enabled. Um, we determined from the outset that we would be, whilst we're a charity, we would be um, as professional and as commercial as was appropriate um, for us to do what we needed to do to deliver our mission. Outside the box, uh, we formally launched in June 2013. Can I just... Um, and we launched uh, originally outside the box just described our cafe the strap line for our cafe is that it's more than just a cafe it's a community cafe and it's um it works as a commercial operation but within that it has as a focus enabling young people and adults with learning disabilities to have more fulfilled independent and healthier lives um, the cafe itself operates on a model of we open, I'm talking about without the, without the presence of COVID, we operate on a seven day a week opening. Um, we 
on each of those days, if you were to come into the cafe, you'd see members of our paid staff team, which comprises kitchen catering, barista, front of house staff. You'd see a team of support workers working with our members who are in fact our clients. We call our service users members um, because we like to assume and reinforce the fact that they are part of the outside the box team. They are not for us passive service recipients. So you see our, a group of members um, and then you'd see some volunteers from our local community. So it can be a busy old place even before we have any customers in the cafe. <laughs> um, the focus for members in the cafe, sorry, is that we are aiming to give them um, an experience of, of, of being in a real workplace to help develop their skills, improve their confidence, raise their general profile and kind of connections within the community. We started in June 2013, we had, I don't know whether anybody's heard of the Big Lunch, which is a, a project that came out of, um, it's a national initiative now that came out of the Eden project. And the idea was you, you would use food at a very local level to bring people together. And we launched in June 2013 with Ilkley's first big lunch. Um, and people basically just brought food and drink along to the cafe. We then opened for two days a week. We had half a dozen or so members and it was run entirely by volunteers, including the, 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 the three founding trustees. By March 2020, we were open seven days a week, nine to four every day. We had 60 members, so 60 service users every single week. We had a team of over 60 community volunteers and they were everybody from young people doing their Duke of Edinburgh through to unemployed people, through to refugees, asylum seekers, students, uh, from Bradford through to retired people, etc. A really diverse and very, very committed team of volunteers. And our staff team was getting up towards the mid um, 20s, 20, 20, 24, 25. Our income base um, was obviously a combination of the trading income from the cafe. Members pay using their direct payment um, budgets or, the, or their agreed packages with local authorities, social services um, to come to us. Plus we were using grants and we had quite a, not, not huge, but we had a, an ongoing um, steady stream of donations from individuals and local organisations and employers. Alongside, between June 2013 and March 2020, we also diversified the kind of range of services and activities that we offered. Conscious that not all young people and adults with a learning disability are attracted to the catering hospitality sector. So we now run something called Outside the Box Choices, which offers a whole range of different courses, workshops, activities, projects, um, which span arts, crafts, printing, textiles, photography, drama, um, keep fit, um, lots and lots of different things. And we also now run something called Outside the Box Working Life, which is about taking those members who are keen to secure paid work on a journey that enables them to realize that ambition. Um, the levels of employment amongst um, people with learning disabilities are the lowest of any group and have remained low for decades. Um, in our small way, we're trying to address that. In terms of our kind of size and scale, 
Year ending 2014, our turnover was 153,000. Uh, by mid end of 2019, it was over 500,000. Along the way, in those years, we, we won um, local hospitality business of the year. Um, we got a People's Choice Business Award, so the local community voted us the best local business. We had the BBC come and do a little piece on us. We featured in the Guardian Society section, um, particularly for our work in progressing members into paid jobs. In kind of early 2018, we realized that we'd, we'd actually outgrown the cafe premises. A big, um, the, the cafe is kind of purposely designed to be non-corporate, so it's quite quirky, it's quite contemporary in its styling, it's very colourful, it's um, quite relaxed, it's got a kids area, um, and so a big, a big part of our customer base locally are families. And once you had half a dozen buggies and lots of um, toddlers running around in the cafe, plus our members, volunteers, staff, support workers, it was quite a busy, busy um, place. So we decided that we would start the search for new premises. We were on a lease on those old premises. Um, and so we just started to look around, see what was going on um, on, the, on, on the kind of retail um hospitality catering etc uh property market we also around that time we realized we wouldn't be able to afford to buy anywhere uh, unless we um got some help so we also started to at a very informal level just make make some contacts with um potential social investors and the most positive um, at that stage were with the charity bank. We then identified some premises came on the market locally, which are very large, um, much larger than we'd anticipated that we would want to look at. Um, flagship local building called the Victorian Arcade in Ilkley. Um, with the help of the charity bank and a huge amount of work, as Edward said, in terms of business planning, financial forecasting, um, building our what, what I've described as our corporate capability. So actually making sure that we're not just doing good work, but we as an organisation are in the best possible shape got all the policies, all the processes, procedures. We've got the management rigor that we need in order to take this next step. By October, we'd, we'd bought those premises, which was, which was a huge and quite scary step for, for us as an organization and our board to take. We, were, we, we had built up our reserves, we invested some of our reserves and we had loan finance of over 400,000 to do that. We then sat on those premises for a while. I think we were kind of almost trying to just recover from the shock of what we'd done. Um, <laughs> they were partly tenanted by businesses at that point. We thought we're just going to sit on them and we're going to take the, the rental income and we'll build up our pot of reserves so that when the, when the time is right, we can remodel those premises. It's the ground floor of the premises in order for us to um, design and deliver the type of new cafe environment that, that was our vision. And then COVID hit. We closed, obviously, the old cafe premises. We went online for most of our member support services. 
and we after a month or two decided that we would bring forward a plan to accelerate um, the time scale for the capital development works on the new building. So we got, we got um, builders came on site against a big contract of work um, in May, May, June 2020. The cafe in the arcade opened on the 2nd of October this year. And I've just put on the bottom that we also, um, as a result of the approach that we've taken to using social investment, we've very recently won the um, Social Enterprise Yorkshire and Humberside Social Investment Award. I'm now going to show you our new premises. So on the left is the uh, is is the Victorian arcade. We have replaced that roof, the glazed roof in its totality as part of our capital development work. And then on the right hand side, you can get just a flavor of that is the remodeled ground floor. You can have a look at the next one. We wanted to try and carry through some of the aspects of our old operation, our old premises um, through into the new cafe. And when we set up our original cafe, we held a, a couple of creative community consultation days. What, and, and, and that mural, that graffiti wall, is the result of one of those days. What do you want from your community cafe outside the box? Um, and there's some great stuff on there. Well, the, we, had our, we had our members, we had potential members, we had families, we had lots of people come in and um, just scrawl graffiti all over the walls of the old premises. Um, that was before the builders came in and did the work. <laughs> and that is one of our members. Very, very pleased about a creation in the kitchen. So that gives you an idea of our history, what we're about, what we've done. Our governance. Um, we have a trustee board, which currently has six members on. Some are um, quite long-standing members, so a couple have been with us um, for most of the time that we've existed. Um, a couple are relatively new, so have joined us within the last um, two to three years. We have a very good um, span of expertise, so we have business, finance, HR, catering, uh, volunteering, and, and also disability and learning disability expertise. Having said that, none of the board and, and neither myself nor anyone else in the management team had any prior experience of social investment. We were very, very new to it. We did, however, have a champion, and that was our chairman, who is a um, very successful businessmen in their own right and a very, very experienced um, accountant. And that's been really, really helpful to us um, in that we've had, we've been able to draw on his expertise just in terms of the numbers and the finance. Plus he was, he, he has, he has kind of encouraged and reassure, uh, acted to kind of reassure the rest of the board. We've had to do a lot of work in terms of being clear. This, in, uh, this was in, 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 in the kind of planning and discussions with um, the charity bank and other potential um, lenders about why we were doing what we wanted to do. Um, 
what the benefits would be um, financially as, as well as to the social impact that we were able to make and what, are the, what were the implications for us in taking on that finance. Lots of modelling as, as Edward said earlier, worst case scenario, best case scenario, somewhere in between. And um, lots and lots of iterations of our risk analysis, none of which included COVID. <laughs> um, we're quite unusual as a charity in that we have monthly meetings of the board and We've always had monthly meetings of the board and right the way through the last uh, two years, through, through the pandemic, that has continued. We've had monthly Zoom meetings and the board are taken through, um, almost whether they like it or not, um, a lot of financial detail, a lot of performance information across every bit of our business. Um, and a lot of throughout the pandemic, a lot of cash flow um, iterations and a lot of forecasting. Lovely. OK. Final, oh, sorry, final. Sorry. I know I'm going on is is as it's already been mentioned in the involvement of board members early in the process. So we brought. Um, our charity bank um, contacts into board meetings very early in our discussions. Great. Um, I think I've got one other. One other. Our learning, very quick run through. It is about taking risk. It, it, it does feel very hairy, particularly for an organisation um, of our size and scale, but definitely worth it. Enable the board, so keep them really, really well informed. Um, and also make sure managers across the organisation understand what's being proposed and understand the implications of what's being proposed. Very, very rigorous financial reporting and financial management. An open and trusting relationship with the investors. So, so we have, with the charity bank, had lots and lots of, of discussions through the pandemic about how we managed the repayments against the loan, significant loan, and they have accommodated us, and been very good at accommodating us. Um, leverage the investment. The fact that we took the risk and have made it work thus far, um, and obviously have managed to, to, to convince an organisation like the Charity Bank to loan to us is, is quite impressive to other potential funders. We know that other potential funders have been impressed by that and, and have, have given us money as a result. The, the, the whole kind of... Um, process that we've been through has very much reinforced our mission. It's given us a kind of reinforcement um, amongst lots of different audiences that what we are about is being ambitious for our client community, that we want to do more, we want to do better for them. And there's been lots and lots of spin-off benefits in that we've now got the space and the platform to be able to further diversify our services and we've got a stronger profile and reputation as a charity. I think I better start there. Brilliant. Thank you, Louise. That was great. Just to, to follow up on. So, um, Louise, you talked a lot about... Um, you know, you initiated um, the conversation, you know, started reaching out. But how did you know who to go and speak to? So one of the questions about the chat is, now, how, how do you know which social investors are out there? Who are the most suitable ones? You know, after all, social investors, you know, they're not like HSBC and Barclays. They don't have on the high street um, shops or presents that you can go to. 
So, um, yeah, how, how did you actually start that process? And I'm, Edward, I'm going to ask you a similar question about um, Big Issue Invest or any of the other investors you spoke to. Yeah, it, it kind of, it, the, the, there wasn't very much science to it, I'm a, <laughs> I don't think, from our side. Um, we, it, it kind of came down to us doing, a li- doing some research. We knew we needed loan finance in order to, in order to take the next step. Um, and so, you know, it was basically about us, us using good old Google to look at what was out there that, that, that would potentially match to our size and scale as an organisation. Um, and um, us talking to um, some other similar sorts of charities who we knew in our region who had managed to secure some loan finance, not necessarily from Charity Bank, but actually had been through the process. Um, And actually, um, what ultimately led us to the Charity Bank was personal connections. So so, so people who knew people. um, And that's what we, we we met with the charity bank not because we were going to necessarily ask them for the loan finance but or, but largely to pick their brains about um okay. social investment and um we then over t- over quite a short time but a series of meetings um decided that we would pitch to them okay so and, and Edward, what about what about you? I mean, I'm gonna. Uh, this is one of the the missions that that we have really around trying to educate and engage. But but you know, ha- same question to you. Uh, interesting. I don't know how the original relationship with Big Issue Invest um, came about, but clearly it was probably around the 2005, as I said. So it was quite an early stage in terms of looking for sources of funding from different uh, providers of investment. But that relationship lasted all the way through. I'm um, just looking at my notes here. We we finally paid off one of the loans in 2018. So, and we had about five different loans. We consolidated right. them at one point into one. Um, interestingly, I, we've also borrowed money from RBS and Shawbrook over the time yes. for the same. So there's a mix of lenders. And I think most of that is about who offers the best deal at the time, in fairness. So I think... Um, pick up on Louise's point, once you've got into the cycle of, of getting used to the idea of taking money and using it to d- help develop the enterprise, you, you, it opens up wider possibilities there are either for other forms of um, grant type model of funding and or uh, other lending models. So um, anything to do with a property asset, I think you, you generally can find people who will back that because people are very used to valuing properties and knowing what they are prepared to lend against that and so on and you can I think when you're doing a slightly more um, of an enter, a newish enterprise which is trying to generate revenues and a return that's going to therefore pay back that loan that becomes a more interesting exercise for both the lenders and for you as an organization I think in terms of putting that story together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I think one of the challenges we have um, for social enterprises and charities that, you know, everybody's so passionate about wanting to get to the impact. And I, and I loved um, what you were saying, Louise, about, you know, um, like reinforcing your mission. And I also, from the flip side of that, Edward, like the way you said, you know, we had to make a decision, you know, whether we, we scaled and grew um, and whether we had the capacity and whether that was within mission or whether we, we sold and, and refocused. And I think both of those points are really valid. But what we tend to find is that people want to get from A, I've got an idea, I need to borrow money to Z, let me borrow some. And actually, there's a whole bit of work in the middle. So Mm. there's not all social investors do the same thing. Um, They specialize in different bits of lending. And there are over 50 different social investors. So um, one of the things that Good Finance does is provide you a whole list of investment advisors. You know, there are new people lending. Again, we won't tell you that only social investment is the right thing. It may well be that mainstream bank lending like RBS is, is something that you would want to do. It sometimes can be more competitive. Um, but there is a real difference, for instance, in those that specialize in what Louise is talking about, which is a secured loan, essentially like a mortgage, you know, against an asset, which is the um, least 
risky, not no risk, but the least risky type of um, borrowing because there's an asset that if things go wrong could be sold to repay the debt. But if you're borrowing um, uh, development finance or working capital, because actually like working capital to cash flow a contract is the biggest requirement for social enterprises or charities because they tend to have to put the work in up front. And again, Edward um, talked about this in terms of the contracts they deliver and then get paid later down the line. Then obviously, um, if that money um, isn't going to get repaid, if things go not according to plan, there's nothing that could be sold. So that's the highest um, risk. And, and, you know, the cost of finance is directly um, relevant to the risk that the investor is taking and also to the where the money comes from. So there's mm. a difference, for instance, between borrowing money from a philanthropic source where that money hasn't got to be recycled to say borrowing it from uh, charity banks are a really good example because actually their assets, um, their lending comes from holding uh, savings and, and assets uh, of, of other organisations, of other social enterprises and charities. So obviously you don't want to put that hugely at risk. So um, I would definitely encourage you to um, do your homework, shop around and, yeah, have a look for some. Sometimes people stay with the same lender. You know, it, oh. it's a relationship that's going to um, stay with you over a number of years uh, on average you know, um, lending is between three and five years for un- unsecured, but, you know, can be 10 to 20 years on a secured loan. So you're going to be working with this organisation um, for a long time. So it's really important that you you share some of that. So that brings me really neatly, actually. We've got um, a great question um, that's come in the chat from uh, Tom, uh, which is about um, the cost of finance. This one always comes up. Thank you very much for raising it. So how do you calculate and agree um, uh, internally the rate or affordability of repayments did some considerations on the financial terms seem to carry greater weight for instance the length of repayment holders interest rate loan years or decades unsecured or offer of guarantees let's let's come back to the some of the technical bit the, at the end in terms of all the different bits and let's just 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 have a look at the cost so when you were actually um thinking about borrowing finance did you did you have a number um, in your mind that would make it acceptable? And I'm asking you that question because I I often get people come to me with a number in their mind and then, then I'll tell you what my response is. But yeah, Edward, what about when you when you were looking around to borrow money? It's a good question. I think the, I don't actually have a very straightforward answer funnily enough because I think some of it depends on the, that what, what you're borrowing the money for, and therefore there, there are certain sort of bands almost within which you're going to be given offers against that. Uh, and also it depends, and you've, re- you've highlighted that in the question, um, Tom, which is the guarantees and stroke, what, what, other, what other mitigations that the lender might have. So in the SCA Trafalgar, which was an operating subsidiary of SCIA, there were parent effectively group guarantees which help keep the interest rate down. So you're clearly always trying to get the lowest possible rate cost of that funding for that particular project. And there are ways, and again, at the trustee level, you're then looking at where are you prepared to put the rest of the organization's assets, e.g. the reserves and other forms of finance at risk against this business plan. And that's kind of mutually reinforcing because it, it makes you really be very, very sure that you think the business plan is going to work uh, and that you've got some mitigations when things don't quite go to plan and so on because you're protecting the overall organisation at that point. Um, and it, it, it's that kind of dilemma that the board g- genuinely needs to discuss and get comfortable with because if they're not, you're going to, as I think Louise uh, or as, um, maybe mentioned, I think the trustees can disappear if they don't get, if they don't like this. They, they kind of head out the door, which is fair enough, because if you're changing the model of the organisation, you, you've got to have a team on board who want to go with you. So um, there's quite a lot to that question, actually. It's, it's yeah. really, uh, it, just, it, it boils it down to the nub of, of the whole thing. I'll let Louise. Mm. So I, I, I'd, echo, um, I'd echo your comments that I think um, it's complex. And, and at the end of the day, the the it's about the degree to which the board are wholly committed to the proposal. You know, and, and we, we lost, we did lose 
uh, we only lost one, but we lost one board member um, who fundamentally disagreed um, with what they perceived to be an unacceptable level of risk being taken by us as an organisation. Um, but, but the majority of the board, um, although apprehensive about the risk, were willing to do it because they could see the benefits of it. They could see how important it was for, for, for our future. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the, 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 the key thing for us was that um, it was the only way we were going to do some, something like this. And um, we had done all the number crunching and the board were, I mean, I'm not, not to say that they were all um, completely steeped in that, but um, the people who needed to be assured of it were assured of it. Okay. I'm going to come to both of you. These both pick up on really good points here. One around what you do to help uh, um, the board or, or to convince them or to get them to comfortable. And you picked this up before, so I'm, I'm going to talk to that. But I'm just going to come back and finish off on, on the cost of capital piece, um, which Tom um, asked about. Uh, and the reason I asked you about the number is because I'm not sure there is one. Um, I, I'm with Edward. It depends on what type of borrowing you're doing. So if you are um, borrowing on um, asset secured, you, you might currently expect to pay somewhere between two and four percent. You could definitely look at mainstream lenders. You won't get it. It depends on you know the range is about five or six different secured specialist lenders in the social investment space. Um, it'll depend on. Have you done this before? How long do you want to borrow it over? Are there any other charges on the building? It's those sorts of things. On the um, unsecured lending, it could be anywhere between, I would say, I'm giving you a, a ballpark here, between sort of six um, through to 15%. And it will depend on whether there is a, a tax relief or a guarantee or um, uh, some other caveating factor that you can apply to the finance, because this is high risk lending um uh but it also could depend on you know we talk about the difference between um debt or, or loans and shares and equity but there are some ways that you can look at borrowing different types of sort of uh, more patient risk bearing capital so things like um crazy equity or crazy equity i don't know what i'm um, often called or like, it often referred to as revenue participation as something that acts a bit like equity a bit like sort of dragon's den um, money, but um, which is often because we don't have shares is um, has some kind of forbearance to the, the level of profit. So the upside rather than uh, the sort of liquid um, exit that a dragon would get by selling um, um, can be uh, obtained. And so what's really important, and Louise said this, is about trying to work out what type of finance, how much do you need to borrow, how long over. And, and the story that remains with me, is somebody said to me, oh, you know, I, it was too expensive. And I said, so well, what do you mean by too expensive? They said, well, I wanted to borrow at 6% and I could only get it offered at seven. And I asked them to, to work out over the period of the loan, yeah, actually how much that meant and could they afford the repayment and therefore was it worth it? Um, also to shop around, but essentially if you can't get it down to where you want it to be, that probably means it's too much risk for someone to take and for you to take because you need to do that stress testing. What happens if things change? So um, there's not a simple um, answer, but there are some resources. I know Annie's um, posted those um, in the chat that can help you get a better understanding of the cost of capital. So let's just come back, circle back to this question about um, what challenges did you face when trying to convince those board members, you know, about taking social investment on? And sometimes I think you've both given us the answer. Sometimes it, you, you're not going to and you need to agree, like with Lisa did, that maybe being a trustee with that organisation isn't right at that moment in time. But I'm really interested to explore this piece about being a champion or having some key people um, inside your organisation who have a bit more expertise or skill and are there to both support the um, the operational part of the business, as well as the um, governance part of the business. So, um, Louise, you talked about having one uh, key person on your board that really helped with that. 
Yeah, it, and and um, I mean, it didn't necessarily have to be, but it it coincidentally was our chair. Yeah. Okay. Um, who who has um a kind of healthy appetite for risk, um, and is 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 ambitious for us as an organization and 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 he manages um to kind of cascade and and enthuse yeah. others with with both of those aspects of, of, of how they then come to board meetings and involvement with the organization mm -hmm. um which i suspect that if we if, if he didn't, he, if he wasn't the person that he, he is and he didn't have that approach, we would not have done what we've done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he also has the expertise. He's not a social finance expert at all, yeah. but he has the kind of finance acumen and business expertise to give the kind of reassurance and confidence that other trustees who you know will readily admit um do not like the numbers <laughs> um they look to him for reassurance and levels of confidence and yeah. guidance if you like um so yeah i mean he ha ha having him as the chairman has been a, a a really critical part of our journey so far um but the, the other thing I mentioned was that um, I think it's important to go beyond the board, if you like, to to the management team as well. Yes. So that yes. so that people who are leading services and delivery and operational aspects in the organization also understand what's being done mm -hmm. here. Yeah, definitely. And and what it what it kind of signals in terms of the nature of the organization i we are we don't just say we're a social enterprise mm. we don't just say we work in a commercial way that we work in a business-like way that's what we do <laughs> yeah, absolutely and it is so much a, a joint you know this has to be something that works across um uh, the organization edward you talked about you know the management information and you talked about the sort of the scenario testing um which i think is really important that comes out time and time again when we hear from from other organizations um so you know did you have experience of that because you obviously got different uh, you've got group structures and you've, you've got experience of working across um, different organizations you know just what's your reflection on working with different uh, boards and different trustee members and about you know the level of comfort or concern that people have uh, about managing that information yeah there's an interesting contrast between SCIA and Merton Music Foundation for me so SCIA was always built to be a contracting model so it's always had a kind of a board that understood that um, and therefore it's always managed those risks as a set of trustees and the idea of social borrowing money and social investment kind of came with the terrain or put it like that with Merton Music Foundation it's interesting because it it was a it basically delivers uh, music services to schools in the borough so a lot of these services still in-house they still belong to the, uh, still run by the local authorities this one happened to be spun out again 30 odd years ago and set up as a as a as a uh, charity at that stage um and the interesting thing there is that the the management team if we if we ever talk about finding funding from other sources and social investment the, a lot of the management team because they're sort of steeped in this being a, a grant based organization uh, they haven't quite realized how big a social enterprise they were our grant income is about 20 percent of the total and 80 percent of it is coming from delivering music services and lessons and so, on. so it's been an interesting kind of exercise and a big part of that um picking up on Louise's point was actually having an FD uh, who's happens to be a neighbour of mine who retired and then sort of joined this on a part time basis, and he really started asking them really questions they'd never asked themselves, but he came at it from a slightly different angle. Um, and the interesting thing there is that the whole sort of dynamic of that management team has now moved on. They're really quite not commercial in any sort of 
sort of genuinely commercial sense, but they're definitely definitely thinking about uh, the way the organization works and operates in a different way. And as I said, we've gone through the last two years uh, with the, the whole sort of how did we respond to mm. the lockdown and the impact of that. And it and we've the only we have talked about social investment, but we don't really need it fun enough. Um, the time where we might need it is if one of our neighbouring authorities, for example, Kingston, suddenly decides to outsource its whole music service, in which case we would end up potentially taking on that. The, the huge issue there is pensions, teachers, uh, related pensions, which actually is almost too big a stumbling block to even get past the first hurdle in fairness. But it's the sort of thing where we would potentially go and find backing in order to do something, because that would double the size of the organisation, etc. So I don't know if that's really answering your question, but it, no, it does a contrast between it depends slightly what organization your starting point might be, I think. It's a yes. long journey if you're not used to the idea. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, no, I think um uh it, it does. And I think this point about having a champion, there's a really another good example from an organization called We Make Places based in Liverpool. And the CEO, who was the one who said, you know, early on in the journey, I sort of felt the board relied too much on me and um, they realized that perhaps unlike Louise they didn't have some of that expertise that actually went out and recruited a board member who mm. had got that background who could who could present the right amount of challenge and and bring those questions um funny enough in terms of you know very topical trustees week this week you know the the skills that are most required for boards are uh, financial expertise marketing expertise and increasingly data and digital so you know um I think having that right balance between your executive team, the operations team and your board um, is really important. I think the other thing that's been really central to bring out here is the fact that, you know, borrowing money is not just for big organizations. You know, the average first time need is 50,000 pounds. But I love the example and, and, and um, the one from Louise is another great case study I love. Um, uh, somebody actually I know really well from when I worked in, uh, I'm based in the, the Midlands. And um, they were a charity who had um, leased their premises for years and years and years, were given notice on their um, premises, needed to move out and find them. They did something very similar, bought a base. And I remember actually saying to me, I never thought for one moment, Mel, that borrowing money would save me money because essentially they were paying less on their monthly rent, but they'd added to their balance. The property was growing in value. So they actually became um, a more resilient, more investable organisation. And um, uh, I know Laura's commented on, on this point, Louise, that you made, and it's absolutely true that sometimes you can borrow a relatively small amount of money, but that can really give grant makers a lot of confidence that you've got a really sustainable model and therefore um, that can um, give a wider range of different um, funding mechanisms can give them real confidence to be able to invest in you because they know that you've got that commercial mindset that you've done your due diligence that there is you know um, a good chance that they're going to be able to repay that money i'm really conscious of time we're coming yeah, to I'm, I'm sorry i am actually going to have to dial out no problem no problem we're just going to thank you so much for your time louise and we'll make sure that these slides are available thanks again edward if thanks you just, very much everyone thank you i'm just going to um finish off now and if you just put my last slide with the lessons on and we'll make sure that all of these um uh slides and um the the video recording um is available for everyone i thought i would just finish with six top tips um for good governance um and i think that we've covered most of these actually um from the speakers so um if you're in startup mode think about if you'll need to raise investment in the future it's never too early um to factor that in right at the very beginning because it might help you choose your governance structure um, number two, understand how the legal structure you've got is relevant to social investment. Go back to um, that really helpful handy document, the link we shared, but there's also some more resources on good finance. Um, Edward and Louise did this brilliantly for me. Get your board on board and do it early. Um, no big surprises at the end. You're going to um, need those. Um, understand the risks. Um, everybody said, and, and it was reinforced by Lisa's quote, that charities and social enterprises take huge risks every day, that this is just another form of risk and it's all about getting the balance right and making sure that it's an informed choice. 
So um, get informed, learn from peers. I usually find that there's someone else out there that's probably been on this journey before. And um, we're great at sharing. So don't feel that you've got to go it alone. Um, and we have a whole range of these here from peer case studies and also on get informed that we'll send out afterwards. And then finally, um, once you've got all of that information, you know, make good choices. Um, and hopefully um, that will make sure that you can answer that question about is it worth it? And don't forget that the thing I said right at the beginning, social investment is just a tool for creating impact. If you have any follow up questions or want to get in touch, we'll make sure in our follow up email um, that we send out our contact details. Thanks again to our speakers, um, to Edward and to Louise. And also thanks very much, um, Laura, and to um, Nasip for partnering with us with us on this event today. And for those that weren't able to join us, we'll be able to make sure that we circulate the recording. Thanks very much for your time.